Okay, uh, so welcome everybody to our first college squash education seminar. Um, this is what new college players should know. Um, and my name is David Pullman. I'm the CSA Executive Director and League Commissioner. It's really great to be with you here this evening. Uh, we've done, uh, for those who have been tracking along, we've done um, a few of these sessions around recruiting in the past. Um, this one's going to be a little different. We're, we're talking about um, the player's experience while they're in college now. And, um, and so let's, uh, we'll try and stay on that topic for most of the session today. For those interested in more recruiting information, um, we have great resources on our website. Um, csa.com um, and there are panel discussions just like this one and, and other resources available about recruiting as well. So it's great to have you here. Um, the idea for this session really came from our discussions with our um, parent advisory committee and that's a new committee that was started just about a year or two ago um, it's made up of uh, parent volunteers of current college players, some, some junior players, and some college players who have graduated. And they kind of have a two-pronged approach for us. They help by um, advising CSA leadership and management on um, topics that parents and other members of the junior community might want to know about um, or where there's a void of information. Um, and then they also in certain ways help advise um, other parents in the community who are just starting to go through, say, the recruiting process or their, or their kids are just starting to play college. So um, we are very grateful for their support. Um, in particular, I want to call out um, Danny Cups, Simone Winston, and uh, Moran's, uh, Chris and Alyssa, uh, for their, their leadership of this committee and for pushing us forward to, to get this done. Um, so we're, we're really grateful for their support. And I'm really grateful to have our three panelists here with us today. Um, I think you can see them all. I don't know if they're in the same order, but I'll start sort of uh, clockwise. In my upper corner is uh, Craig Thorpe Clark. Craig is the head coach of the men's and women's teams at Bard College. Um, he is, uh, he's been doing this a long time and has a ton of experience. He used to be the president of the CSA uh, when it was a predominantly coach-run organization. Um, he coached for 11 years at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he coached for four years at Vassar College, uh, and now he's at Bard College, uh, where he's been for the last uh, eight years, I think. Um, so Craig has wide and varied experiences and, and great, um, great insight to share with us this evening. So Craig, thanks for being here. Um, thanks, David. Next to Craig is Nadia Usenko. Uh, you, some of you may recognize Nadia. She's a uh, former Trinity College student athlete, um, All-American, just graduated this past spring. Um, and we're pleased that she's moved on into the coaching ranks uh, in college squash. She's now at Amherst College uh, in her first season as an assistant coach at Amherst. Um, and we're lucky to have Nadia here. She'll bring a great um, sort of player perspective as well as um, some early coach impressions as well. Uh, so Nadia, thanks for being here as well. Thank you for having me. And uh, last but certainly not least, um, my good friend Chris Sackvey. Many of you have seen around the, uh, I'm sure, the Arlen Specter Center over the last year. Uh, Chris is now the um, head coach of the men's and women's teams at Columbia University. Um, just started, I guess, a couple, just a few weeks ago, probably a little longer than that, but um, just getting the calendar started this year. Uh, prior to his time at the Spectre Center, Chris was an assistant coach at Columbia. He was the head coach at Dickinson College. Um, he also helped out at Brown and St. Lawrence, I believe. Uh, he's a Cornell grad. So as you can tell, Chris's experience is, is wide ranging as well. So we've put a, a great panel together with lots of different experiences to share with you. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, for those joining, please stay on, on mute uh, while we're going through the, the questions with the panelists, um, but feel free to come and show us your face. We always uh, happy to see people tune in. Uh, save your questions either for the end um, or you can put them in the chat and they'll come, they'll come to me and, uh, and we'll go through those. Um, so panelists, to start off with, talk a little bit about uh, the balance, you know, it's always a balancing act between in college, between academics and and your athletics playing on a team. So um, 
as new players are joining your teams, what tips do you talk to them about in terms of scheduling their classes and, and playing squash and, and, and meeting that balance? Uh, Craig, if we could start with you and, and go to Chris, that'd be great. Hey, thanks, David. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Um, you know, at a, at a place like Bard, academics is, is placed pretty highly as it is with all the squash schools. Um, it's really finding that balance and trying to be organized early on. Um, communication is, is vital with professors, with coaches, understanding as, as you're thinking of coming in what those uh, expectations will be with practice, uh, with training, um, and, uh, you know, how you can um, manage your schedule to fit what you'd like to study, um, what you have to study, and uh, fit all the squash activities in that you'd like to do. Chris. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, good to, good to see a, such a big group on tonight. Um, yeah, I think uh, I echo, echo Craig's sentiment that, you know, there's, I think, getting a good start is huge. So I, I speak about that a lot. Um, you want to you wanna start by being organized, feeling on top of your classes so that by the time the first set of tests rolls around, you're not, you're not overwhelmed and behind. Um, I think David left out a big piece too. The, they're also balancing this new social piece. It's not new, but it's, I think that's something I speak about a lot too. So you have kind of these, these three channels that, you know, are three buckets of things you're putting your time into, your athletics, your academics, and, and this social piece. And so like any one of those, um, you know, and oftentimes it can be like the social piece will like upset the balance in your academics and in your squash. Um, and so I think managing that early and, and kind of figuring out how to manage your time um, is super important. And, and I think the, the, the biggest message that I, I have is, is, you know, if all three are kind of working nicely in harmony, typically, you know, you're going to feel a lot more on top of your stuff. And, um, and, and also, and also like, there's no reason why you can't be excelling in your academics while, you know, really putting a lot into your squash. Um, I, I find like they tend to go hand in hand a lot. It's a great point, Chris. I'm glad you brought that up. The, the social piece is, is really critical and takes up a lot of time um, as well. Uh, Nadia, if you could give us your impression as a, as a recent player, how did you approach your, uh, those, those three buckets? We'll, we'll talk about all three that, that Chris mentioned, um, the academics, the squash, and the social aspects. What strategies did you use? Time, time management is definitely key. You should prioritize what you want to do first. Uh, before you can have some rest and uh, definitely you don't want to have all the hard classes in one semester it's you should plan ahead as, uh, this as well and spread out take some easier classes com combining with harder ones and on like this Nadia how so you mentioned hard classes how, how would you get a sense of which classes were hard and which classes were easy Usually we have the number, like the level of the class that will tell you how hard it is. If there's any pre-requirements, it will also explain what you need to know before you can take this class. So 100 level classes are easier usually than you have 200 and 300 level classes. It might be a little bit different based on the university, but uh, introduction classes do not need to have any pre-requirements. So they're a little bit easier than others. And... Nadia, how would you, what would you, um, what would you communicate to your, um, your coaches or, or your professors about kind of like the other aspects? So what would you communicate to your professors about your squash season? And what would you communicate to your coaches about, or, uh, about your academics? In terms of professors, you will definitely have your squash schedule way in advance, so you will know when you will play away or you will play at home, but it will be in the evening, so you might skip a class if you have evening class or sometimes on Fridays you play playing away. So if you tell your professors way in advance that, hi, professor, unfortunately, I cannot be there. I have a squash match, 
What can I do? I know we have a quiz, for example, this day. What can I do to cover this up? Uh, professors will be willing to help you and they will really appreciate if you let them know in advance. If you come up to them on Thursday and say, hi, professor, tomorrow I cannot be on the class. I know we have quiz, but how about uh, that's not really nice and <laughs> you might get in trouble for that. But in terms of academics, uh, the same way works with coaches. If you let us know in advance that you have uh, some TA sessions sometimes, I know they are not on the class schedule, but you really need to go to some teacher assistant session to prepare for exam. We will be very understanding uh, about it because you're first of all student and then athlete, and we want you to succeed in classroom. That's excellent. Uh, Craig, from a coach's perspective, what, how do you uh, kind of compel your, your players to make sure that they're planning ahead uh, with their academics and their travel and things like that? Yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. I've had a couple of meetings today with um, some time management um, discussions. Uh, and I think while there are a lot of resources on every campus, you know, the coach is certainly one of the first people uh, and one of the people you see most often. So those discussions can, you know, quite quite easily happen with the coach first. Um, it can be as simple as sitting down with the schedule, um, blocking off times, making sure that, you know, as Nadia mentioned, that they know, understand the schedule. Um, they've actually made notes of when they need to be, you know, preparing to travel, those sorts of things. Um, so it's really the communication key. You know, uh, we see the players every day. We know if they're, um, maybe a bit more stressed than usual. They could be trying to do too much. Um, and Chris mentioned the, you know, the social side, the academic and the squash. It's, it can be a lot to juggle at times. Chris, do you have any additional, any strategies you'd like to uh, communicate to your players as far as communicating with, with professors? Anything you ask of them? No, just echo that early, that early communication being, uh, being so key and, um, I, that's every school I've ever been at. Uh, it shows that like you're being thoughtful um, about, you know, their class and their time. Um, and, and you, you know, you understand its importance. And, and I think everywhere I've been, typically, I'd say, you know, the high, high percentage of professors are, are willing to work with you as, as long as you're, you're organized and, and being good about it. Yeah, I would I would just add from a CSA perspective, you know, um, athletics is such a big part of almost all of the campuses where we have varsity teams. Um, it's it's a big part of campus culture and student experience, and um, and and the professors and the administration on on, a, on almost all of our campuses recognize that. You know, they they know that they have athletes in their classes. They know that. For in the Ivy League, we're we're allowed to work with our student athletes for four hours, kind of doing skill development, two hours strength conditioning. So anything that happens outside of that would be considered a captain's practice, um, basically a team run session um, where the coaches aren't aren't involved. So I think a couple of the keys there are, um, you know, attendance attendance isn't supposed to be taken by coaches and um, and, and, you know, like that, that's definitely a big one. And, and there's not supposed to be really any coach interaction at, at that session. Um, yeah. So I, th I think that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, 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 yeah, I mean, it's the best thing to keep in mind is that it's, it's an introduction. The squash season is a winter sport, right? So, um, a lot of a lot of the action early on. You want to meet your teammates. You want to play. You want to start being active before the season starts. A lot of that is student student organized. Um, Craig, in your experience, I'm sure you've you've had um, a number. You've been able to recruit players, obviously, over the years. You also had walk ons uh, players who are, who do not really go through the recruiting process. Um, what what would you say if if any are there any difference in expectations? between being a, a recruited student athlete and versus being a walk-on on a team? Have you had both and how do you manage that, uh, that kind of different distinction? Yeah, um, I, I, have had, I have had both. 
certainly with recruited players, there is that expectation that, um, you know, they're, they're coming in with a prime purpose of, of wanting to play and compete. Uh, quite often there may be a player who turns up and knocks on your door and says, coach, any chance I can turn up and play? And, and I would say just about every, just about every program would uh, encourage that player um, to come and have a hit, uh, probably just a bit of a hit with the coach to see where they, where they stand. Um, certainly I'm in a position, I'm, I'm always um, uh, scouring the dining halls for squash players. Um, and then encourage them to come over and, and have a hit and try the game. Um, you know, as far as the expectations, once a, once a walk-on has come on and said, I want to play, and the coach says, yeah, I think we've, you know, one, we have space, and two, I think you've got potential and you'd like to play, um, then uh, we would go through the steps to get them, um, you know, medically cleared, do the compliance training, the Title IX training, um, and then the only allowance that's probably there is then their schedule may not be totally compatible with the practice schedule because they they didn't know what it was uh so then that's when the coach has got to be flexible and say i can work with this player they can turn up early and leave early they turn up late and stay a little later um so there needs to be some flexibility to accommodate them and then perhaps as the season goes on in the second semester they'll be more in tune with with exactly the the formality and of of the practice sessions with the rest of the team. Awesome. But if you're a player and you want to go play, go knock on that coach's door. Don't be shy. Yeah, we actually, I just want to echo that. We, um, we had a college squash presentation at the women and girls summit uh, a couple of weeks ago and had, um, had four coaches there and they all said the same thing. Um, you know, sometimes there are, there's, uh, there's uh, trepidation or concern. If you're not a recruited athlete, how are you going to get on a team? Uh, almost to a person, all of our coaches uh, welcome players to come by, but you have to show that commitment, right? You have to show, you have to show up and be prepared to play. And um, Nadia, I was going to ask you, uh, you've, you've probably had some, some walk-ons that you've interacted with, uh, maybe even as a coach, but also as a player. Um, did you feel like everyone got the same access to coaching and, and um, apparel and gear and things like that? Is there any difference once you're on the team and they're committed to playing? Uh, definitely everyone is treated the same way. Once you're committed and you're in the team, you're part of the team. You will get the same uh, equipment. You'll get uh, coaching. Uh, you're now in the team. So uh, there is no difference how we treat recruits or walk-ins. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the key, I think, is that commitment piece and just showing up and making sure... It, you're following the coach's instructions, uh, ultimately. Yeah, also, I would like to add and emphasize that it also doesn't matter where you are standing on the lineup. We also treat everyone the same, no matter if you're number one or you're number five or you're number nine, 10, 11. And even if you're not playing during the uh, match with another school, you're still there, you're supporting your team because you're part of the team and you play a very important role. Yeah, I think that's a great, um, I thank you for bringing that up, Nadia. You know, one of the unique aspects of college squash is the team, the team nature of it. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are, have either come through junior squash or you're in junior squash right now, and uh, you're often playing for yourself um, uh, or, or and representing yourself and your family in tournaments. And when you get to college, you are part of, you are part of a team now. And uh, that has, um, you know, great benefits that we, we love to talk about, uh, but there's also expectations that go along with that. And, um, and that means that you're showing up when everyone else is showing up, you're following the coach's directions and, um, and you're experiencing it the same way everyone else is. Um, Nadia brought up the, the lineup or the ladder. Um, Chris, I, you know, this is kind of, um, I think it's probably specialized. Everyone has their own approach, but can you talk about the lineup a little bit and, and, you know, how often someone generally could expect that to change or, or how it does change from, from place to place. I know you've been in a number of places. You've probably had some, you've had some head coaches that have probably done it differently than you do it now. So what, what's your impression of how the lineup changes from time to time? Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in kind of starting fresh every year. So giving people a chance who have worked hard over the summer um, to kind of, you know, to, to earn, a, earn a fresh spot, um, giving first years a chance to challenge, um, challenge like for their starting position on, on the roster. 
Um, so we're actually, uh, you know, the wheels have been spinning for like a week on um, how to do this this season because uh, sometimes you have a, a nice easy number like 16 and you might just want to do a 16 person draw. Um, one of our teams has 18 and it's like a funny number to, to try and draw up some team tournament for. Um, but like the ultimate goal is, is always how do we start from like a fair place and give everyone a fair shot? Um, and then, uh, you know, I've, I think, uh, I've been at places where maybe like the challenge ladder, uh, became such a priority at certain parts of the season that you're almost hurting, you know, you're, you're going into weekends, not fresh enough. So I'm a, I, I try and communicate clearly when challenge matches will be, how many you can expect, and then when not to expect them because it's going to hurt, you know, potentially the performance on a weekend. So, so typically I think if we have a, a weekend off, you know, we're going to try and play a match in that week to one, stay competitive and two, um, uh, give people a chance to move up and down. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I had to guess, you're probably getting, you know, at least 10 challenge matches a year. So, um, I think a lot of places that I've heard of and been at, it, it's on a on a kind of one up and one down scale. So if you're number eight and you beat the number seven, you become the number seven and you get to challenge for number six the following week. But if you lose and you become number or you, you're number eight, you have to challenge down to protect that spot again. So, um you know, it's a it's a stressful it's a stressful environment, but it also prepares prepares everyone for our real matches. So, Craig, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think it's um, uh, it's it's a great dress rehearsal for real matches. Um, I, I always give my players twenty four hours notice so they know who they're playing, um, what time they're playing. I always have the matches marked and refereed by other players. So we try and make it as realistic a competitive environment as possible. Um, and then I, I always go by those results. Uh, I think that's important uh, for the structure of the program that the player knows if they turn up and they're ready and they work hard and they win, that they've earned the right to play in that position for the following weekend. Um, I, I just think that that gives the players confidence in, in being rewarded for results. Um, if you don't put the work in and you lose, you know you're moving down. It's a great point. Um, and uh, I, I admire that. I think it's important for new players going in to understand what your coach's expectations are around challenge matches. Not, I, I do know kind of from personally speaking, not everyone um, has the same philosophy as, as Craig or Nadia or Chris when it comes to these sorts of things. And so this is one of those situations where you're, you're going to want to make sure you're clear with your coach, your specific coach about what their expectations are. Um, Craig, why don't you take the next one about, you know, expectations for playing during breaks, um, you know, Thanksgiving or winter break is right in the middle of the season. Um, I know this differs also with our schools. You've been at, at kind of a very high level and, and uh, also a, a lower ranked level. You know, how, what are the different approaches to that? And excuse me a sec, I'll step away, but uh, carry right. on. Right. Uh, so certainly with higher expectations of recruited players coming in, they will probably have home clubs. So if there's a break for Thanksgiving or winter break, after a few days off, they'll probably go be, you know, back down the club and playing again pretty regularly. Um, that would be pretty normal, certainly after having had a good first half of the season. Uh, you know, I know in, in, in my situation with a lot of new players, they don't have the opportunity of a home club. So, you know, we may have some players who don't play for a month, for example. Uh, the end of the season, um, they have exams, they go home for vacation for the holidays over the Christmas break in particular. They come back mid-January and they may not have played for three weeks or a month. Uh, so that's going to depend on, I guess, I guess, their experience level. But certainly from a coach's perspective, you know, we want the players not to be having too much time off. But Chris made a good point before about freshness and not, not overdoing it. So after a hard few months of team practice, having some days off and feeling fresh before you go back on court is very important. Nadia, what about from a from a player's perspective? Can you talk about your experience a little bit uh, when you would kind of return to 
practice. Um, uh, I know you're you're an international student, student. You were an international student athlete, so it may have been a bit tougher to go home. But can you talk about that? You know, the the breaks, Thanksgiving, fall break, winter break, spring break, things like that. When you, you know, how often you would play and when you would return to campus and things like that, or when your teammates would return. Usually for Thanksgiving, uh, you will have matches right after Thanksgiving, so you want to play a little bit more. Uh, just to remember how to hold the racket pretty much for the winter break as well. You're diving in from after Christmas break straight to the heart of the competition. So you really need to feel confident and uh, you don't, you're you not expected to play hard every day, like two hours a day, no, but you should understand what, uh, what to expect in January. And for the spring and summer, I would say spring, usually people take a lot of time off from squash to regroup. And then uh, during summer, uh, it will be more off-court work to prepare fitness. Um, yeah, Any, uh, that's great. Um, anything to add, Chris, on that front before we switch switch gears a little bit? Um, yeah, it, it, it's always a tricky one. Like, um, like, like you know, like Craig was saying, I think there's some people have like a little more access than others. Um, some people's family, you know, might want to travel to a relative's for a holiday dinner. And so they're out of, you know, out of commission for a few days. I think the message is always like, do what you can to be ready for, you know, for ready for those matches. Um, and so for some people, they're not, they don't need to, to play squash five days a week if they keep up their fitness a little bit off court. And, and, you know, they just keep their hand in it over, over the break. Um, yeah, to Nadia's point, I mean, it, it's a January and Feb are our major months, and it's it's kind of funny that we basically have close to you know three weeks or three and a half weeks off between the exam period and the holiday period right before that. Um, the message I always say is like, college squash players are without their coaches for a lot longer than they are with their coaches during this during the year. So like you need to have people who are self motivated, self motivated, right? Um, that's for every break um, and and all the times that just like you know your coach isn't going to be around. Yeah, that's a great point, point. Um, and that that actually um, helps set us up kind of for our next topic, which is um, sort of inclusion, belonging, team culture, setting that stuff up. Um, I just want to say I have seen some questions come in. Um, so far, most of them have been recruiting related. Uh, as you can tell, we're talking a lot about the college player experience for this session. Um, we, we may have some time at the end to talk uh, about recruiting questions, but for now, I would direct you to some of our resources um, on, our, on the website, csasquash.com. We have, we have several recruiting um, videos and panels just like this that are linked on there as well as some written documents as well. So if you're looking for some really in-depth recruiting information, um, I would direct you there. Um, we're not gonna cover too much of that tonight. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so moving on to kind of team culture, um, you know, more and more college squash teams are made up of players from different regions, not just of the country, but of the world. And uh, I think this is a good one for all three of you and your varied experiences. You know, how do you, um, how do coaches bring different players from different backgrounds together and build a cohesive team culture and that unique sort of team aspect of squash? Uh, Craig, I'll start with you. Thanks, David. Um, uh, first of all, it starts, it starts in the responsibility lands with the coach. Uh, to provide a good positive environment uh, that's open um, and welcoming to everyone. That walk-in comes in the door, come on in. Um, and Nadia made the point that once you're in, you're, you're part of the team and, you know, those expectations of the team are, are, are applied equally for everybody who wants to play. Um, and I think that I'm not at the pointy end of the season or of the rankings, so my expectations of the season are going to be a little bit different. I'm, I'm looking for a positive, uh, positive experience, a good learning um, opportunity for my players and a place where they feel, all feel comfortable, they have a voice, um, 
they can offer suggestions, offer ideas. I like to listen to most of them. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the students, the students are all well informed. Um, they're all uh, very in tune with, um, you know, having a voice and having a say in something they're, they're deeply committed to, and which is playing and learning squash. So I, th I think it's team building exercises of practice, team meals together, um, and just, just also doing some things outside of squash that will bring people that maybe the best players are not so good at something else and the other players can help them. So I just think just, just you know, letting players know they have a voice and um, being encouraging to everybody. Chris, anything to add? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, coming in as a first year head coach, it's, it's, it feels a little bit more like now there's this kind of, we're starting and we need, uh, you know, we need to find, find our kind of like find our culture, right. And, and build this culture kind of one, once things are rolling and you, you have, you have those first years who are now second years or third years or seniors, um, and and they were they were welcome to the team and they had a positive experience when they arrived on campus and you know um, the the older players invited them to dinner in the first couple nights and so like it you know helped people get settled that kind of stuff gets passed down um, and so to Craig's point it starts with the coaches but um, I think those good cultures can kind of sustain. Uh, and the, you know, older players can help, can help foster that environment. Um, because once again, we're, we're kind of around at the courts where our offices are always open, but we're, we're not there at the dining hall all the time and we're, and we're not there on the weekend. So, um, I think so much of that, you know, definitely comes from building, building strong leadership and, and helping, helping that leadership understand how important that is. And then it, it's a trickle down effect, uh, ideally. Yeah, yeah, you uh, great, great segue to kind of our next point. I wanted to turn to Nadia and talk about the players, the players' role in sort of building that culture. You know, moderating conflict amongst players. You know how you were. I think you were a team captain. You know how do you kind of learn that as you go, and what lessons will you kind of take with you as you go into coaching at, at Amherst, and and uh, you know how did that all work for you? If you see as a player or as a coach that something is going wrong, you definitely need to step in. You should not wait to see if it's going to resolve on its own. Uh, you should, uh, as a player, you should also always speak up if you see that something is going wrong with your teammates. Uh, and definitely you should trust your captains and coaches that they're there for you to help um, make your experience as a student athlete uh, very enjoyable right so it's definitely tricky uh, once you're captain how to balance between um moderate situation with the team on its own or bringing something to the coach uh so maybe Chris and Craig have more input on that yeah I mean that's a great great segue you know how do you guys what what tips do you give to players what do you tell your freshmen your first year players as they come in, when if there's a conflict or there's something that comes up amongst the team, how do you direct them? Uh, Craig, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, this comes down, you know, Chris's point to good leadership and and having that um, that team culture build up over a few years. I mean, the uh, we need to empower the players so they feel comfortable one in talking to the captains, uh, even though they're obviously upperclassmen. And then, you know, as coaches and Chris said, our doors are always open at the courts having that confidence to come and see us, um, to talk about that. You know, we, uh, we go through what the team guidelines are as a team. We go through those when we're talking um, with our leaders, uh, what's expected um, for them to reflect on their experience. Um, was it positive? Was it what were things that could be done better from even last year to this year? Um, and to reflect and to try and just make an overall better positive experience. But players should always feel comfortable in coming to the coach's door. That's a great point. Uh, and that kind of leads to one specific um, concern that comes up, I think, from time to time um, in the sports world in general. Um, you know, I'm sure it happens in the squash course too, but the idea of, of hazing 
Um, and, and, you know, kind of the difference between what hazing looks like versus what being a new player on a team looks like. And, and how do you, you know, if I'm a new player, how do I differentiate between those two things? Um, I know, you know, I used to work on a college campus, uh, a few different college campuses, and there was, there was training about that and there were conversations about that. But, you know, when you're a, a new player and you have, you're trying to figure out your way on campus, you know, a lot of, sometimes that stuff kind of goes in, in one year and doesn't really retain. So how do you, how do you guys, Chris, how do you guys reinforce that uh, with your teams as, as you're getting started at the beginning of the year? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think like, you know, some of those things were kind of masked by like, you know, tradition. Um, and in my experience, I think a lot of that has just phased out over the last, eight, you know, six to eight years. Um, I think, you know, one of the one, you know, the, the first years I have to clean the bus, like that kind of thing. So how we, how we, how I, you know, kind of tried to change that narrative on everything is like, you know, every, everyone, everyone sweeps, like cleans the bus on our way out. And so you're not, you're, you're never allowing um, those situations to take place, even in very small forms. Um, because then hope you know you you never want it to carry into something bigger that essentially I think you know that hazing is you're making people feel uncomfortable uh you know in any in any way so um yeah little things like that right you know like making sure all those little chores and team duties aren't um sprung on a certain group or um anything like that and um yeah, I, I think just like it's got to be a zero tolerance policy. And um, I, yeah, I think I think I think at most places, um, I think a lot of those traditions have been put to sleep, hopefully. So um, and that that's something like, yeah, I'm you know, I'm very conscious of. Uh, and, and you're obviously once again, speaking probably more to the leadership about it, that that this this can't, you know, can't happen in any form. And um, they're spoken to by compliance and, and different senior leadership when they when they get to school about it. And so that message uh, is is typically relayed loud and clear. Yeah, and, and it has to be. And you, know, you mentioned the zero tolerance. It's um, it, 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 it can cause if, if hazing is found, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have read about it around the country. I mean, it's a serious uh, there. It's a serious offense and can cause some have some serious repercussions. And, and so it's important to speak up if you feel like you're, you're, you know, something like that is happening and ask questions. There are, you know, resources on, on campus, whether, whether it's your coach, the captains or, or someone outside of the athletics department, you know, there are people who can help advise you on that front. Um, we're, we're getting pretty, pretty well along. So I'm going to transition one more time uh, and talk about something that's, that's become much more prominent um, in recent years. And that's, that's health and well-being of student athletes and um, making sure that everyone feels like they're healthy, not just uh, physically, uh, but mentally, emotionally as well. Um, you know, Craig, can you talk a little bit about um, some resources that you know are on campuses pretty much everywhere for people to tap into if they feel like they're struggling? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the coaches are uh, very good sort of first responders in some cases because we see our athletes every day. And we know around exam time or midterms that everyone can be stressed and someone may need, you know, some time off from practice to get more work done or, or whatever. Um, you know, all, all the institutions provide good resources. Um, sometimes the biggest hurdle is asking for, you know, making that call and asking for, for um, some support. Um, here at Bard, we've we've had a, a sort of a new initiative uh, with athletics that some of our counselors are now hanging out at the gym. Um, they're going to come and talk to every team, so that every team uh, knows, you know, who they can contact. If it was Chris, they've all met Chris. They know Chris, um, and certainly with 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 athletes who may be injured, that adds another another level of stress. They're trying to find their place in the team. They're trying to get ready for the match on the weekend. So an injury could be could add more stress. So you know the, our our um, counselors will be spending time in the training room, just hanging out, just saying hi, just making that initial connection, so that if someone does need some help um, and some support, 
then they know that they could, they've already made that contact and they could send an email. Um, and we're finding that that, that type of, um, you know, breaking down barriers and making better connections can really, can really be very helpful and useful, especially for first years. You know, there's a lot going on, you know, um, those resources can be very handy. Yeah, Nadia, do you remember, um, you know, utilize, experiencing that, people coming together, uh, you know, how, how are those resources communicated, you know, as a student athlete, if you remember sort of more, um, you know, more recently, you went through year over year. I know the NESCAC is, is you know, kind of very, very well versed in a lot of these different areas. Do you have, do you have kind of personal experience to share on, on this front? Um, I think we have all experienced how hard it is, how hard it can get, especially like during COVID year. We all have experienced how, how mental health is very important. And so if uh, I would say coaches would give you a lot of resources where you can reach out, uh, what uh, centers are available for you at college, uh, counselors, as uh, Craig has said, and uh, you should never be afraid to do so and always ask for help. It's a very important skill to also ask for help if you need, because you should never struggle in silence. Yeah, it's a great, great way of putting it. Um, Chris, do you have any experience with someone who, you know, is maybe coming up against a difficult time and is considering kind of just giving up squash, you know, kind of, um, you know, they're feeling like, competitive squash might not be for them. How, how as a coach, have you seen or have you managed a situation like that? And, and what would you recommend someone who's having those sorts of thoughts do? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 I think from, you know, the last year was the first year outside of college squash for me, but, and I know that it was a particularly challenging year on college campuses after um, a year and a half kind of, you know, very virtual and with very broken schedules. So um, I think there was more, more people, you know, reassessing where they were putting their time and, and, and how they were, how they were viewing, you know, their athletics. Um, and then I think on the flip side, there was a ton of people who were so happy to get back to that routine and competition. Um and I think, yeah, the last few years has, has shown everyone that, um, you know, the mental health is so important. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, I feel like there was probably more of a mentality of like, everyone should gut everything out and everyone should be at everything. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we all have been relaying this message that we want it to be a very enjoyable experience. And I don't think people, coaches 10 years ago didn't want it to be, but I think just the way we approach it now might be a little different. So if, if we're giving people a lot of flexibility to take that personal day when they're struggling, um, you hope that if they love squash, right, that they, that like those little, those little things will make a big difference for them, but they're still going to be in college. Um, I think it's becoming more common too. There's companies companies luring away college student athletes before they even graduate. And, and so people are making decisions on, on careers or how much research can I do on campus? Um, and so it's, it, it, those conversations are challenging. And, and you, I think when, I think, you know, as coaches, we're, we're trying to support, uh, support people as best we can. And obviously we'd love to have always have the strongest team possible and have everyone enjoying the experience. I think if someone really doesn't, uh, isn't in that, in that headspace, we're, we're obviously going to ask, you know, why is there anything we can help with? Um, you know, is, is this something, you know, that might be temporary and, and, you know, can we give you some space and, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it definitely happens. Um, it, it's probably, you know, 50 different reasons why. So it's always a hard one to, to pin down, but. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, one thing I want to highlight, um, from working with all of our coaches is that it's important to remember that the, the coaches are, are human too, and they're going through a lot of the stressors, um, different stressors, of course, but, but a lot of stressors as well, especially, 
having gone through the pandemic and, and trying to keep a team afloat virtually and connected and things like that. And um, so many of our coaches are, are very well experienced. They've been working with young people for a long time and, and, you know, they, they're not uh, unaware or immune to, to what's going on. And um, so, you know, like I, I agree with what Chris said, I think people are more in tune with, with mental health challenges now than ever before. And it's important to ask for help. You're not alone. Um, there are resources on campus. Uh, you should ask early and ask often if you need to. And and the coaches are in your corner. You know, they want you to have the best possible experience and and be a key member of the team network and the and team camaraderie. So, um, you know, that's it's something that is all on, on all of our minds right now. It's a major. Uh, major topic of conversation at the administrative level as well in college campuses, and it's just really all over. And uh, and there's support there for you, so so don't hesitate and and uh, you know don't immediately give up on something that you might you know might be a real support network for you as well. Um, those are kind of that's the main list of prepared questions that we have for tonight. So I do want to while well, we have about ten or fifteen minutes left in the session. I do want to open it up to questions from uh, any of our group members um, who are tuning in. If you, um, I, I haven't seen any sort of college experience questions come through in the chat, but if you want to put one in the chat, please do. Otherwise, uh, you can you can uh, give me a, a raise your hand emoji or just unmute yourself, and and we'll take a question directly. Um, but now the floor is yours. Um, we're we're open for some questions now. Well, either uh, we've done a good job covering the covering the main topics, or oh, I see some coming in. Fine, here we go. Yes, um, hang on. Let me uh, now they're coming fast and furious. <laughs> um, so, study abroad is another question that was kind of a side question that I had. Um, you know, Nadia, I think I saw you had some teammates who study abroad. How was you know how was that handled? Uh, how was that handled on your campus, you know, at Trinity when you were playing? And then um, I'll open it up to uh, uh, to the guys as well. But study abroad, was it allowed, not allowed? How do, how do people go about that? It was allowed, but for the fall, because obviously you don't want to go abroad spring and miss like uh, <laughs> the season. But it's very hard to keep yourself in shape when you study abroad and then come back right after uh, Christmas and start playing. Uh, so if you, it's, of course, sometimes you will not have access to squash at all based on what country or city you chose to study abroad. So it's uh, some piece to consider. And uh, at least uh, I hope you can run outside as much as you can to stay fit. Um, yeah, so I, I think the general theme from my experience is it's allowed, but the coaches generally encourage players to do it in the fall so they can be back for the championship season in, in the spring semester. Um, th this question I've heard before um, in terms of timing of practices, uh, this does tend to be different, I think, from school to school. Um, Craig, can you get, can you all give us an example of examples of where you've been and when your practices have been, just to give kind of a an overview of the different options or different examples of when it might have happened? Yeah, um, it it depends on the institution and and the resources they have. Uh, here at Bard, you know, I'm doing you know I have two teams, so I'm doing basically from five to eight p.m. Um, as students are through class. I, I never really have a full squad at either practice because there are a lot of evening classes. Uh, so, you know, I've got to be flexible with that. Sometimes I'll hit with someone at 10 in the morning to sort of, you know, make up for that. Uh, some schools will have uh, a break in the middle of the afternoon where maybe between three and five, there are no classes. So it's open hours for professors, a chance to go and, you know, get other things done. Uh, and that's usually a good time for, for coaches to run practice because they know everyone is technically available. Um, and, you know, on every campus, you know, we say, you know, um, practice is, is mandatory. However, you, you know, there are legitimate, legitimate um, academic reasons why someone perhaps will, you know, miss part. There could be a speaker on campus. 
And so there, there's always that flexibility. We'd always like to think everyone can make practice, but the reality is, you know, busy schedules and we're all trying to squeeze a lot in. Chris, can you give us a couple examples of time practice times at the different places you've been? Yeah, yeah, I've been to some schools where I think, you know, night classes are not are not much of a an option or or a thing, and so at those schools, you know, typically there's there's kind of a a period where every almost every class finishes, call it at four four o'clock p.m., and so you might start practice at four thirty. Um, if you have a a men's and a women's team and you can't practice at the same time. There might be a 4.30 practice and a 5.45 or 6 p.m. practice. Um, and, and yeah, like more recently uh, at Columbia and at, at a couple other schools I, I know of, um, there isn't as much of a, a strict kind of academic ending to the day. And, and afternoon and evening classes are, are, are fairly popular as well. And so we, we, pick, a, we pick a practice time. Um, student athletes at some schools have a little bit of an early um, registration period, so they're able to try and fit their schedule around practice windows. Um, so we practice during the day. I know there's some schools that practice in the morning. Um, and, and so I think it runs the entire gamut uh, and, and, and different schools have, have yeah, different ways to, to work around um, conflicts and, and things of that nature. Yeah. Nadia, how many, how many hours a week would you say you spent on practice during the season? So you would have five, six days uh, per week and hour and a half for squash. And then usually we'll also have lifts. So uh, three times per week, perhaps. So there will be the range, you know, obviously players want to practice more and have a hit with assistant coaches or coaches. Uh, individually they can absolutely can do this yeah yeah i'd say that's pretty standard right an hour and a half to two hour practice session um five to six days a week depending on how how much you know how far you are into the competition schedule um you know um we've got a question about games or, or matches per week um you know overall during the course of the season our teams average about i would say um during the regular season, around 14, 15 matches uh, over the course of the season. It, most of them start in kind of mid-November and go until mid-February with, with kind of a break for winter break. Um, January is often a very heavy period for a lot of our teams because their uh, winter break extends later into the month. So you can often play two matches a week, sometimes three matches a week during that time. Um, but once you get a little farther into the season, you know, some teams have conference play. Um, you know, I know Ivy League, NESCAC, Liberty League, um, they're all represented here on our panel. Um, you know, they tend to do one to two matches a weekend with nothing during the week, kind of rest up for those big conference matches. Um, so they end up with, like I said, 14, 15 matches during the season. Then they might have uh, a conference championship. If, if your team is part of a conference, you play multiple matches on a weekend. Um, and then the national championships, the team championships is a three-day event uh, in February and March. And, and um, that, that guarantees you three matches during, during those weeks. So in the end, you end up playing, you know, teams end up playing anywhere from kind of 17 to 20 matches a season, uh, basically. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that's that's pretty accurate across the board, coaches, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, it's short, short and very compact when you when you take away that kind of three week um, that three week holiday with exam period and and the winter break. Um, so you're playing kind of twenty matches and in, in a in a fairly tight span. Um, but it, it's definitely a shorter competition window than, than most junior squash seasons. That's right. Uh, and I, I have gotten this question a couple of times. It's a, we'll end with a recruiting question because I've gotten a lot of those, but I always like to ask this question to our coaches. Um, 
these three coaches in particular haven't been on some of our other recruiting panels. So I'll put it to each of them. But um, what when you're recruiting student athletes or when you're looking for players to join your team, what what do you look for? Um, what is your what are kind of the main things that you seek out? Uh, obviously, squash skills are are a, a good part of that. But um, is that is that is it squash skills be all end all or are there other things that you take into account as well? Um, Craig, I see you smirking there. Go first. Oh, well, not, nothing else. That's why you smirk. You know, I in in talking with recruits and seeing them play, you know, their squash is all great. Um, they can all come. They can all come play for me. Um, so then it, it 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 comes down: is this is this someone I, I'd like to spend time with, and and do they mind spending time with me? Um, because then if if we start off with a good relationship then that, that's going to, you know, just bode well for the coach-athlete experience. Um, so, you know, demeanor on court, whether you win or whether you lose, um, being, you know, a nice handshake when you meet somebody, um, being, being engaging about academics is important, and being confident. Excellent. Nadia, you're going into your first recruiting cycle as a as an assistant coach. What are you going to look for when you're meeting recruits? Well, you definitely want to recruit someone who actually loves squash. No, <laughs> yes, because then uh, you don't want to see some of the players who struggle on court and trying to fight themselves rather than concentrating on practice. It's not a really good impact on your team or overall, and we would, don't want to hurt that individual as well. Uh, and be, yes, someone who can benefit the team, not just uh, squash-wise, but uh, being a good part of the team. It's hard to see because squash is very individual sport, and then this transition to the team aspect is uh, very crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, I'll give you the last word. Um, yeah, I think to sum it up, you know, it's it's really kind of a three-prong uh, approach in these in these overarching themes. It's kind of character, and that's kind of on court and off court character is is huge because as Craig said, we're spending tons of time with student athletes over four years, and so we want to um, make sure we enjoy that time. Um, and and then and sportsmanship piece, we're like we're having to watch you play. You're representing the school, the team, us, and so. Um, no coach wants to recruit someone that's going to make them look bad uh, 20 times a year. Um, and, uh, and then, and then, you know, there, there's, a, there's of course an, an academic and a, a academic piece, which, which is unique to every school and, and different schools kind of look, look at different, different things. Um, and then the, the squash piece is, is, is kind of also multifaceted. It's, you know, what have you done and, and kind of where are you going, you know, so potential and talent and athletic potential. And, and to Nadia's point, I think like a massive one is, is like, we want to see people who look like they're, they're enjoying it and, and enjoy competing. Um, and, and that's not, that's not easy to, to show when you're in a, in a big tournament, but, um, but, but like that, that that's also something that can be a goal, right? Like becoming um, becoming stronger mentally in your squash. Hopefully, um, you know, will will everyone will be watching you, kind of seeing that you're you're enjoying it a little bit more than you are stressed. That's a that's a great way to finish. Um, so with that, uh, I, I really want to many, many thanks to uh, Craig and Nadia and Chris for joining me tonight and sharing their insight. Um, thank you all, uh, our, our participants, attendees for coming. Um, hopefully you you got something from this, um, this session. And uh, for those who came here looking for a little more insight into the recruiting process, again, I send you to the CSA website, check out our recruiting resources and our past videos. A lot of the questions that you asked will be answered in, in those materials. So check them out. And, um, and yeah, good luck to everyone who's starting their year and their season and anyone competing at the, the JCT in Philadelphia or other, other matches this weekend and, and along the way, good luck. 
thanks again to the Parents Advisory Committee of the CSA for uh, for pushing us along and helping set this up. And uh, and we'll see you out there on the courts. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, take good care.